With Jujutsu Kaisen chapter 271, we finally reached this end of an era with the conclusion of one of the series that has defined the early 2020. All the various battles throughout the series from the iconic moments like Gojo using domain expansion on Jogo to the heartbreaking moments like Nanami dying to the final battle against Sukuna. It's hard to believe, but this, my friends, is the end and we get some controversial closure with the main villain of the series in this chapter and there's a controversial over open ending that we're going to have to unpack here because there's some beautiful messages that I think too many people haven't actually caught on to. So we open up the chapter where the last one left off, where Nobara reveals that she didn't see any type of curse on this woman when she was inspecting her. And we see the trio begin running through their options for how the curse user might have been operating this whole time, particularly Fushiguro after he states that the user had to been operating within the area, which is ideal for their target since there are so many blind spots in this downtown area and it gives Gege the opportunity to hop in this time machine and go back to a much more simpler time, the era that fans call Jujutsu Kaisen Season 1, where we see Fushiguro getting annoyed by the stupidity of Nobara and Itadori, only this time they aren't trolling him so much as they're just coming up with ideas that he shoots down immediately as not being worthy of trying, and my god, are they spitballing here. Yuji's big idea is like, hey, let's go out into the open area, and Fushiguro I was like, dude, just think for a second. Unless this guy is a giant, it's not going to work. And then we see Nobara and she's teasing Yuji. And it's in this moment as you're watching Yuji and Nobara throw out all these horrible ideas and they make fun of each other for how dumb they sound. All that pain and the suffering that you suffer from Shibuya all the way to the culling game. For a moment, it makes you feel like you have a weight that's lifted off of your shoulders, like you can finally breathe again. Or rather, that's what Gege appears to be going for here. Whether or not that that works is 100% subjective. This leads to Fushi Girl showing how much of a genius he is when he breaks down his plans to catch the user, which is leave the range of the user's technique and strike when he has to move back into distance to use it. And Nobar and Itadori, they both lose it here thinking, wait a second, that was my plan the whole time. But Fushiguro shows a bit of that big brain planning that should remind you of Toji from back in the Gojo flashback arc where Megami says, hey, dumbass, we're going to be going all the way to the top to that 40 floor condo. We can escape the range theoretically by being so so high up that we're outside of that range which that is big brain in that you now have the high ground and any movement that happens you'll be able to see the target before they see you and that's the brilliance of it it's battle 101 and just this one small interaction he's already figured out the range of the curse technique and came up with a profile of the personality of their target and somewhere in jujitsu heaven gojo's looking down at megami and he's saying toji might have been your father but i'm your daddy who's your girl's playing it works as you would expect. We see the target and they run out into the open, desperate to get within the range in order to reuse this technique. And Nobara and Yuji, they just jump down ready for the attack, not realizing that Fuji Girl is basically using them as bait because as soon as the guy takes off running and thinks that he's evaded them, Megami uses his curse technique and he pins the guy down. This leads to learning the motivation behind the guy did what he did. And we learn that the girl he's obsessed with was a hostess, likely in the Minato Ward, which just the artsy side of Tokyo with all these fancy restaurants and shops, luxury apartments, luxury areas. It's super expensive and it would explain why this girl didn't remember some random guy buying such an expensive purse when she was working because it's not uncommon for her. We then shift over to Yuji getting triggered into a flashback as he starts talking to the kid as he's being arrested and we take one final trip back to that mini time skip that happened before the Gojo versus Sukuna fight took place. Yuji's trying to train with Gojo and when Gojo hears him say let's do the body swap training Gojo shuts it down and says hey man we already got enough Satoru Gojos and he elaborates further on what he's saying when he says he wants Yuji to be more forward thinking and tells Yuji that if he dies fighting Sukuna, life is going to force Yuji and his friends, Gojo's students, to surpass him, but it's a double meaning. Gojo wasn't talking about power here, and with Jujutsu Kaisen being a battle shonen, it can be all too easy to just get caught up in that one aspect, when this isn't the only thing that Gege is saying. In order to get what Gojo means here, you have to go all the way back to Jujutsu Kaisen in the early part, so this would be season one for anime viewers after Yuji was dead. 
dead. So when Gojo talks about resetting the jujitsu world, he makes it a point to say that he's not talking solely about power. He's not talking about just carrying out a massacre. He flat out says it'll be a lot easier if that was his goal because they could just kill all the elders and all the higher ups and anyone who stood in their way, which as we saw with Mei Mei in the last chapter, they're going to have to do that anyway because as long as the old guard are in place, change it won't ever truly come. However, the key to Gojo's words here that a lot of people miss is that he places emphasis on education and fostering. Everyone who he picked, they're meant to play a role. And when he talked about them surpassing him, it wasn't just in power. And that's what Kenjaku missed when he said, oh, Yudo will never surpass you. Yudo will never be the next Satoru Gojo. Gojo never wanted there to be another Satoru Gojo. It wasn't just about power. It was in that they will be able to make his dream to change the jujitsu world come true, which is indeed surpassing them. See, here's the thing. Gojo understood their individuality. He nurtured them in growth when it comes to their combat capability, as well as their character in general. He could have just as easily said, hey, this is my dream, you go make it happen. Basically how Jiraiya did in Naruto in the Naruto manga, where he said, hey, my dream is peace, and Naruto, you're gonna be the child of destiny, which that's the most watered down explanation. There's a lot more layers to it. People who know my Naruto channel know exactly what I mean by this, but this is just to prove a point. So stick with me because I'm about to land the plane here. Gojo could have done that, but then that becomes a burden, something that he himself knows all too well because he was burdened with expectations for his entire life. He wasn't going to directly push that onto his students, which goes back to the fostering part. This also goes back to the whole concept of curses in general. In a way, when you flat out tell them and drill into their heads purposely and shove in their face what his dream is, it would come with the knowledge that they're going to have to carry on his will because they're his students. He's their teacher. So when he dies, there's not going to be a choice there. That, when you really think about it, is no different than somebody leaving a curse on someone. A classic example of a jujitsu sorcerer being aware of how their actions or inactions can leave curses behind on others can be found with Nanami's death and his awareness before he died in front of you. Each of Gojo's students, they're allowed to grow strong and have their own visions and ideals about the world. All he did was simply guide them. Granted, he guided them towards what he wanted, but he still let them keep their sense of individuality, which is what you do when you foster and you teach. Gojo right here, he's showing a lot of humanity when he's speaking to Yuji. He's both expressing frustration and the quick and easy answer that people have come to, which is we even know that Yuta thought, hey, I just got to become Satoru Gojo and we got a chance. And that's basically basically why he says like, hey, we got too many Satoru Gojos. We have enough. He's saying it needs to start and stop with me. We see this dissatisfaction with the burden that comes with the strength that has been given to him, something that he could never escape until he died. We see the concern for Yuji and how he's guiding them through their conversation to seek strength in a different way on more than one level. As we covered a few times, the strongest, it wasn't always about just being the physically strongest. Again, this is a battle shonen but there are other layers to it yuji is the strongest and gojo understood it because it was yuji's compassion and understanding of love that made him the strongest which is why gojo's fist they fell short of reaching sukuna but yuji's fist and its domain in the end it did end up teaching sukuna Despite Sukuna yelling at Yuji and his last words being saying, I'm a curse, it was all bravado, or rather on a deeper level, it was him not wanting to admit his concept of strength was wrong to Yuji, someone who Sukuna had talked down to in the past. Gojo understood, hey, this kid, he can reach Sukuna. This whole conversation has so many different layers of selflessness that are used to humanize Gojo's character, but it's easy to miss given how quickly he snaps back into reality calling Yuji a kid and saying he's so confident right now. And this is the narrative trying to take your attention away from too much of what Gojo's saying while also dropping the breadcrumbs there for you. And even though he calls Yuji a kid, Yuji's answer to the man that they just arrested, it shows that Yuji Itidori understood what Gojo was saying. And he repeats the exact same words that Gojo told him 
which is that he's expecting great things out of him. And he takes it a step further, showing that he understood and comprehended what Gojo was saying, telling him now that he's acknowledged his shortcomings and his failures. The guy they arrested, he can reflect on becoming a better person. And who knows, maybe he can use his curse technique to help him out in the future. This leads us to Fushiguro and Nobar asking, hey, Yuji, what'd you do with that final finger of Sukuna's? And the reveal of the last finger no longer being dangerous. And so this brings us to the controversial part of the ending. But one, when you sit down and you really think about it, the ending, it makes a lot of sense for Sukuna's character. But you have to go deeper past the whole edgelord Sukuna. He's out here killing people. And when he was first shown talking about doing all these horrible things to women and children, there's actually strong character writing here. We see Sukuna and Maito speaking. And it's because Maito, back when he fought Yuji and attempted to use his curse technique, which due to being Sukuna's vessel, when you touch Yuji's soul, you're touching Sukuna. And we all remember how that worked out when Mahito attempted that. So they're in this black void, basically like limbo, if you will. But in this case, Maito's just sitting there and chilling. He's asking Sukuna if he was lying to himself the whole time, revealing to us as readers that he wasn't living the way that he was trying to fool people. He was trying to fool himself this whole time. He only really wanted revenge. And Sukuna halfway concedes to this, saying that he lived the way that he lived and he has a smile on his face when he says it. We then see Urame and what appears to be Yorozu on two paths behind Sukuna and Sukuna standing in the middle of the fork of the road basically with Sukuna saying in his life he had two different paths that he could have gone down and he says that, hey this next time if he's lucky enough to get a next time he wants to walk a different path. This is basically his version of the airport scene that Gojo had, but we see Sukuna is choosing to go north, which drives Mahito crazy. Mahito is a character who is basically associated with chaos at this point by most of the fandom. Mahito tells Sukuna that, hey man, you've grown soft. And Sukuna, as he's walking away with Arame, who's been crying, says that that's all to be expected because he lost the battle. He's no longer the strongest. This should make you think back to what Gojo said in the airport after he died. In the afterlife, he says that his fist couldn't reach Sukuna and that they couldn't teach him what love is, that someone else would have to do it. This monologue by Sukuna proves that Gojo was right. It was Yuji who reached him, and this whole time, Sukuna was lying to himself and he was lying to us while he was inside of Yuji's domain. Gege, by having Sukuna choose to go north and say that he's gonna walk a different path next time, this is Gege showing us that the one who taught him love is Yuji. Yuji in that domain clash and that long conversation. He was able to teach Sukuno what love was and he was able to most importantly force his perspective of the human experience on Sukuna which now makes that whole Yuji's curse technique being able to disrupt barriers and touch souls, that makes everything look crazier now. And as he walked through all this pain and his suffering that he endured and how he went out of his way to try to connect with them, things that Sukuna would never accept under most circumstances, it shows Yuji got to him. That's why Yuji was written as saying that he wanted Sukuna to see the value of humanity through the eyes of someone who Sukuna saw no value in. And despite him saying he felt zero emotions about what Yuji said, Yuji reached him. However, Sukuna walking into the darkness after saying this, it makes more sense when you take into consideration the religious aspect, which Jujutsu Kaisen has used various Shinto and Buddhism references in the past and it's doing so here as well. And it's important to understand that to truly grasp what he's saying here. So Sukuna was not a good person by zero stretch of the definition. Some might even say he was the closest thing to the devil that the jujitsu world had had, but his soul is now being positioned to wander potentially as long as he stayed dormant waiting to arrive in this new era for the purposes of yin and yang and finding that balance only until then will he get the potential to reincarnate along with arame and yorozu and when that happens in his next life his plan is to take a different path just as yuji could have taken a different path but didn't because he had his grandfather to steer him the right way Instead of shying away from love, seeing it as a weakness, he is going to embrace it the way that Yuji did because Yuji is the strongest and his capacity to understand love, 
his ability to receive love, his ability to value love, his ability to protect love, that is what makes him the strongest. The decision to have Sukuna and Maito there, the two biggest antagonists that Yuji ever met, them being together is meant to show that there's a fork in the road. After their encounter with Yuji and their defeat, you either reach enlightenment and you continue down the Buddhist samsaric path of life, death, and rebirth the way that Sukuna's choosing to do after time passes, or you never change in your ways the way that Mahito did, which is why he throws a fit at the end of the chapter. He's acting childish, whereas Sukuna is one acting like an adult. And given how long each have been in existence, it makes a lot of sense, which makes Sukuna's middle finger being sealed up that much more hilarious from the aspect with Jujutsu Kaisen's manga finally over obviously gotta ask my series question which is what is the one moment you were going to remember this series for the most and what is the one thing you would change the most for me I would probably want a little bit more closure on how they ended the calling game did they make a new rule there's probably going to be a data book that explains that but that's another video for another day and also even though the series is over I'm still going to continue to do Jujutsu Kaisen content like Likely with video essays and explain videos like you see me do with other animes as well as arc recap videos whenever the new season for the anime comes out you're gonna see an uptick in Jujutsu Kaisen content for now it's kind of touch and go but thank you guys so much for watching this video and thank you for joining me on my Jujutsu Kaisen journey